I want to thank again the Legatum Institute for bringing this summit to Dar es Salaam and for engaging people across professions, engaging them, exposing them to your work. I've been told that uh, the discussions uh, over the past two days have been robust and uh, new acquaintances have been made, new knowledge has been shared, and uh, this is, can only be good. And I'm happy that uh, important conversation about uh, the human progress, about our shared prosperity has taken place over the past two days. And uh, this is what I expected, given the name and the reputation of Legatum Institute. I've been a good uh, follower of uh, the Prosperity Index for a couple of years now. And as you know, there are so many, many, many indices out there these days from different institutes. And uh, there are only few ones you know, which you can discern some useful information for policy making, for decision making. And Legatum Prosperity Index is one of those. So I, I, you know, the index is very thoughtful, very rigorous, very informative, and definitely very relevant for some of the work that we do or we want to do in government. So I want to assure you that uh, we'll take it up, we'll propagate it, and uh, we'll tell and convince our colleagues to take it seriously, to use it. And this is important because for countries such as ours, with uh, minimal resources for development, you have to make decisions on the basis of evidence. And, uh, and uh, such indices, such as uh, the Legatum Prosperity Indices, informs, can inform our decision making so that uh, you know, we don't waste resources on trial and error on things that have not been proven. So, so this, this is good and keep up the good work. And uh, I hope that uh, the next summit will be back in Dar es Salaam again. And we'll help uh, uh, propagate it and make it bigger and with the impact. Now, uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, the role of innovation and governance in prosperity. And uh, for a politician, we, we really don't like to be narrowed. So I'll speak uh, about 10 minutes, a few words, and I want us to spend as much time as possible in dialogue, in Q&A. So now, obviously, as we all know, that innovation has become a core driver of human progress with the new growth theory and ICT playing a key role. And you may have noticed across the world that uh, there's an intense focus by governments on innovation. And this is because of the realization that it's not, it's not so much about capital accumulation as neoclassical economics, economists would convince us but also the creation of new products and improvement of existing products, existing services, processes, models, that drives productivity. And innovation achieves its relevance or economic impact through two principal channels. One, by empowering productivity improvements, as I have mentioned, and secondly, 
by facilitating the dynamic creation of new firms or activities that add value to the society. And nothing is as important in all these two fronts as the ICT. But uh, you require a couple of things for society to really center innovation in its growth strategy, in its prosperity uh, initiatives. One, you require bold political leadership. Everywhere where you have seen innovation being a critical part of the development uh, thinking, development process, there has been political leadership. There has been bold, serious, visionary political leadership. You can name countries uh, plenty. The factor that always, has always been there is, is leadership. Leadership that put policies and necessary investments for innovation uh, to be important aspect of uh, development process of human progress. Secondly, it has to be facilitative, you know, the, the, the broader political economy of the country is also important and has impact on whether innovation is put at the center of prosperity uh, uh, movement. And when we talk about political economy, we mean, you know, the general architecture of uh, rule of law, for instance, the protection of uh, intellectual property, uh, whether there is security, there is functioning uh, market of ideas, there is financing for, uh, uh, for new innovations, there is a culture of uh, uh, startups and um, and uh, uh, angel investments and, and these kind of things. So the broader political economy has to exist to support this idea that innovation can be a center uh, of, of prosperity. And the final important, important aspect is education. As you all know, uh, innovation is a result of uh, curiosity and uh, sort of manipulation of objects and ideas and concepts and so forth. And this has to be facilitated by the type of education that uh, a country or society uh, provides for its children. Uh, you cannot uh, expect to have an economy that is innovating or an innovative society if the education system does not facilitate that. And uh, one of the things that I personally passionate about is the complete transformation of our education system. Uh, the modern way of teaching children, its genesis has been to create sort of a obedient factory worker, you know. Uh, there's a story that uh, at in one town in the US, there was, uh, you know, people who had uh, factories uh, and uh, they were hiring children, you know, child labor in the 17th century, uh, 18th century, 19th century was pervas pervasive. So kids were working in these factory lines. And uh, this gentleman, his name is Campbell, uh, thought that this is not right. Uh, these kids should be in school, should be you know, put together somewhere, be taught skills. So he went and convinced uh, the industrialists, the, the factory owners, to say that, uh, look, you know, uh, can I have these children so that, uh, you know, they can go and learn. Uh, and uh, when these people were reluctant, uh, he said, look, I will assure you that uh, they will come back here 
uh, a little bit matured, but also uh, more obedient uh, and uh, molded uh, to work properly in the factory setup. So uh, the theory goes that uh, even the seating arrangements in class, the desks, the uniforms, the bell, the timing, is all set up to uh, produce uh, an obedient factory worker. Uh, the education system has not been set up to create uh, critical thinkers, creative people, innovative people, questioning people. It's all about authority. It's all about order. It's all about uh, linear thinking. Uh, and uh, that, at the end of the day, uh, does not help our society. So if we want prosperity, if we want to move our countries forward, we have to reimagine the way we educate our children. And, uh, and uh, there are so many studies that we can talk about, you know, about this, this idea, and I, I hope that we'll take up in the discussion. So those are three things that I wanted to talk about. Political leadership, visionary leadership is very important. Facilitative political economy is very important. And also the education system uh, is very important. And uh, every country is grappling uh, with the way to teach their children. It's not a uniquely African problem. It's not a uniquely Tanzanian problem. The education discussion is across the world, even Finland, a country that is doing so well in education, has just introduced uh, fundamental changes to its education system. And uh, I hope that we can have that discussion as well. Thank you very much. Hello, you, you all know me well by now. I'm the executive director of the Nagatomi Institute. And I will moderate uh, this session of, yes, Q&A, but also you're very welcome to make comments as well. So um, if I could just open it to the floor, who would like to ask the minister the first question? Where are we? All right. Go there we are. Over here, please. Sina Lawson. Thank you very much for this great talk. My question had to do with um, education and how you reimagine, you said, uh, the education system. We had the same issues in, uh, in, in West Africa in general, and uh, it's true that it, starts, uh, it has to start very early on. Is there some kind of model, uh, is there some thinking that we should you know, um, build upon to see how to reimagine the education system? Thank you. I think I'll probably sure. tackle that one while we right. get the microphone moving. Sure. No, this is a, a very, very important uh, uh, question because uh, all of us have been lamenting about the state of education, uh, and, but ideas, transformative ideas on how to actually do it have been uh, limited. Uh, now, there are a couple of uh, conceptual uh, stuff that has have been put out there. One is uh, um, early education. Uh, at what point should uh, uh, a child meet a formal organized education system? Uh, there has been debate, and I think it's still continuing. Um, and um, uh, for me, uh, you know, the model that would work would be uh, a much earlier, and um, uh, it should not be uh, as structured and rigid as uh, we tend to make it. Uh, secondly, uh, is we should we should look at the teacher training and motivation for teachers to go into teaching prof profession. Uh, in most of our countries, uh, teachers go into teaching because there's nothing else.
to do. Uh, and therefore, you don't have the drive and the motivation uh, you know, for them to do, uh, to do teaching. Thirdly is uh, how do you uh, assess uh, uh, performance uh, of uh, children? Uh, because that has an impact on uh, their confidence and what they believe to be correct information. Uh, for the most part, what we have is uh, this rigid right or wrong answers. And this limit uh, kids' imagination uh, and possibilities. So we also may relook, uh, you know, the way we assess learning as well. Uh, you know, and, and many, many, many other things that uh, you know, can, be, can, can be creative. And uh, let kids uh, wonder, you know, uh, and choose what to do. Uh, and if you look at the uh, sort of a classical categorization of quote-unquote important subjects, you can see uh, there's a huge bias uh, towards sciences and math. And, you know, people talk about it, like, you know, science, math is very important. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, some of these kids, they just want uh, arts and dancing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we somehow pressure and force uh, people to do things that they would normally don't want to do and they fail. Um, so there are a bunch of ideas that uh, I think we can, we, we can take up. And um, may I just um, intervene sure. and just say, um, how do you feel about technology in education? Because that's a, sure. that's a big issue in the United sure. States and, sure. and the UK. Just wondered what your views were on that. Sure. Uh, well, uh, there's absolutely no way you can uh, prevent exposure of children to technology. It happens uh, amidst us every day. Uh, now, uh, as far as in formal education delivery, uh, there has been uh, challenges, particularly I'm talking about the experience of Tanzania, is the decision making in terms of uh, technology choices. Uh, when you have uh, a country with, uh, you know, many more resources and uh, you have technology choices dictated by vendors. So somebody comes to you and they say, you need this platform, it will help you deliver education to your children. Uh, and it simply you know, does not work. But I think it's something that we should embrace. Uh, it's something that um, we should think carefully in terms of choice, because if we make a wrong technology choice to deliver education, uh, we may make a huge uh, irreversible mistake. So it requires careful thought uh, and um, gradual introduction so that we can learn where to correct. And, 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 you know, Thank you. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Next question, please. Hello, my name is Ekande. I'm research affiliate at the University of Oxford. My question to the minister is, you talked about Finland and you said they've changed their system. And from my little understanding is that they changed from teaching subjects to teaching topics. Yeah. Would you think um, uh, that kind of change would be feasible to Tanzania? And if so, do you think there will be a political will um, to do so? Thank you. Yes, that is correct. Um, uh, that's what they, they've done. And um, for instance, instead of studying uh, uh, agriculture, you study Africa, and you study everything about Africa, geography, history, uh, and so forth. So uh, now, before you introduce s such drastic change, you have to do an inventory of the uh, capability to deliver on that new change. And uh, there may be, and my personal view is that that's a correct approach, but you have to be realistic with the resources you have and the way you've trained your teachers at this moment uh, 
uh, for you to be able to make uh, that decision. So we may think of it in the future and prepare for it now. Thank you very much. My name is Msambia Mutambala. I work for the Science, Technology, Innovation Policy Research Organization. I'm a researcher. I totally agree with you, Mr. the Minister, that education matters in terms of innovation. But if you can go, apart from education, we have um, some inventors here in Tanzania who, if you can read through the newspapers, you can find some people who are inventing in electricity, in radio, and the other businesses. And the evidence shows that there are many of them, but they are not connected to get uh, or to, to scale up their, their inventions, their knowledge to the another level. Don't you find that uh, this is now a, a right time to support those guys to get finance or to get connected to technological centers or to get connected to universities or other training institutions so that they can now move forward? Because with the MPESA of Kenya, with Max Malipo in Tanzania, we find that innovation is not a magic power. It can be nurtured and can be supported so as to have a good result in this. Thank you. No, you are you're very correct. Um, maybe let me also clarify uh, the point about education, connection between education and, uh, and innovation. What I was saying is that we can reorganize our education system to instill curiosity uh, and, and um, creativity which are two important in ingredients for innovation. Uh, and it is true that uh, you, know, you have people who are inherently uh, curious, uh, creative, uh, who irrespective of the way that education is set up, they will still go ahead and, and, and do things. So that's, that's the point. But uh, your, your point is, is correct and uh, in the three things that I've uh, mentioned as important, one is precisely that, that uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it, there has to be an ecosystem uh, that ties all these aspects. Uh, people who have graduated, people with ideas, with people with money, with incubation, uh, with, uh, with hubs, and with the market, uh, and with mass production uh, capacity in the society. So an ecosystem has to work perfectly. Uh, we are trying here in Tanzania, we have uh, um, engineer Mula Mula here, he's uh, head of our uh, incubator here, and we have Kinu here uh, also. Uh, I don't know whether JP you have been introduced, but uh, let me, do you wanna be on TV? Stand up, yeah? <laughs> you don't wanna be on TV? So uh, you have, uh, we have, uh, we have, there is a sort of a movement. Uh, it's small, but uh, it's emerging. Uh, of, because it has to be both ways. It can't just be government. It has to also be private sector. And we are happy that uh, you know, things are moving. We wish they could be bigger and, and, and many, but, uh, but so far, so good. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier today about urbanization, yeah. and what came up was this idea of a cluster, which yeah. is what you're talking about. Yeah. You cluster together the, the people who, who enable the innovators. Yes. Uh, next question. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, I cannot agree with you more of the three ingredients you, you mentioned. Mm. I agree with you 100%. But look at the three ingredients. The scarcest resource is the leadership with the kind of attributes you mentioned in Africa. Yeah. What do you think should be done to redress that problem? That's a big one. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, uh, the political system has to facilitate the election of good leaders. Uh, people have to be empowered to resist uh, electing bad leaders. 
people should be empowered in terms of knowledge, in terms of organizing, uh, to be able to elevate uh, you know, leaders that are visionary, that are clean. Uh, so far, you know, to be honest with you, that's not the case. Um, uh, the system, the political system, is rigged uh, to favor those with more money, you know? Not necessarily better ideas, uh, not necessarily vision. And this is not a uniquely Tanzanian problem. It's uh, across, across the world, even in mature democracies. They're still grappling with uh, uh, the setup of the political system where money really influence uh, choice. Uh, so as I stand today, I'm as frustrated as you, um, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the system, in the setup. And uh, as a participant in the political process, the political system, um, even the things I know uh, will scare you, you know, in terms of the role of money in a political in a political system, so one hopes that uh, you know as we progress as a country as a continent, uh, we'll reach a point where you know uh, money will have a minimal role in, uh, in 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 political in political in political leadership. Uh, so that's you know that's really I'm I'm sorry I don't have a hope, hopeful answer, but that's the reality. Do Do you think the change begins with the citizen and civil society? Uh, I think the change begin with uh, with individuals as well, uh, you know, uh, because we we like to place uh, faith in the civil society as well. But we know also, without doubt, that uh, there also you know when you have a corrupt society, it also a corrupt civil society as well. Uh, that is self-serving. Uh, that drives their own interest, uh, that just want to be on the newspaper and to have a press release and to have uh, street credibility. You know, that's the end objective. So uh, we have to be realistic, we have to have some perspective so that we don't place so much hope on an entity that cannot deliver. I think it has to start with the ethic of an individual, a family ethic, as to what's important in life, uh, what to value, um, and and therefore, you know, that kind of ethic creates a civil society that organizes on the basis of this particular ethic, mm -hmm. uh, not a collection of people because an issue is popular. Therefore, let's just push it uh, mm -hmm. for us to have credibility. Yeah. Next question, please. We have a we have a cluster. We have a cluster over here. Uh, perhaps uh, we could take two now, George. Uh, I just, honourable minister, I just wanted to add to the previous speaker who was talking about intellectual property and uh, and in the inventions and the funding. Basically, at the Commission for Science and Technology, we do help invent inventors will come up the ideas. We've got an R&D fund, which everybody's welcome to apply. The two things that we're trying to change there is basically one, when you have the R&D fund, a component that says, how do you commercialize your, your results, which will go towards scaling up. So that element, we're trying to see what, how that can be added in. The second point has to do with funding. Yes, it's true. Uh, funding in Tanzania for inventors or tech entrepreneurs is very, very weak. We're trying to see how we can build up the AI, Angel Investment Fund, and uh, couple together with uh, Innovation Fund to work together to see how we can help inventors grow. So, and the third thing is that we've got a lawyer there who works on IPR, Intellectual Property Protection, or rights. They can help you also protect your inventions and what the write-up is required, which is going to be filed with either Brella or Cosata if it's a copyright, basically. So we are working towards solving those issues, what the Honorable Minister was talking about. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mr. Makamba, to 
to see you here. I've just tweeted something earlier about um, what you just said. My company has been helping African government and investors and SMEs for over 15 years to acquire the right tech solution for Africa. Yeah. Uh, and what you mentioned is quite, uh, is quite important. My government, we waste so much money in Senegal. We waste you know, a lot of money going to tech solutions, very dodgy deals, uh, and, and the solutions are actually not working for African government and, and the taxpayers. Do you have any methodologies or secrets you can share with the West African and other African governments? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very important question. Uh, you know, government should not be uh, afraid to seek help for people who know more than we know. Um, and, uh, you know, governments across Africa, you know, do not pay so well, uh, to be honest. Uh, and therefore, people find a way to, you know, uh, so, uh, therefore, good tech people, uh, you won't find them in government. Uh, and therefore, uh, and I've seen it, you know, in, through experience, that uh, people, when they are exposed to a presentation of a tech solution, they're so excited, they want to buy it right away. Um, and uh, a vendor just wants to sell and install and go. Uh, and, and our view is that uh, we should change the way we operate so that we can involve people who know more, uh, people in the private uh, sector, to say, okay, this is what is on the table, you know, what's, what's your view. But in addition, uh, we have to have a totality of uh, government solutions figured out in general, because a lot of government uh, functions are related. For instance, here in Tanzania, we have, and I've been in, this is not the first time I'm saying it, and I don't mince my words as to say that this is a wrong thing that we've done. You have uh, about four fingerprinting uh, entities. When you go to immigration, you're fingerprinted. When you go to police, you're fingerprinted. When you go to uh, uh, some other agencies, about four, uh, to the National ID Agency, your fingerprinted. Now, uh, for me, a government should fingerprint you once. Uh, but if a government fingerprints you five times, something must be wrong. It means there are finger, five fingerprinting platforms which do not talk to each other. That's a waste of government resources. Now, now we have to have a government solution uh, strategy, government technology solutions strategy that tie in things together. So I think that uh, that's what should happen. Thank you. Hmm. Next question. Um, why don't we go this side of the room because we haven't had any questions. The gentleman with his hand in the air, blue shirt. Thank you. Uh, my name is Henry Gombia from the London Evening Post. Mr. Macamba, would you agree with me that uh, moving the movement of uh, goods smoothly around the country, the movement of people smoothly around the country helps uh, strengthen the country's economy? And if you agree with me on that, would, you, would the CCM be thinking hard about the condition of the streets that I've seen here in Dar es Salaam. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, to, be, to be frank and to be fair, uh, if you were in Tanzania 10 years ago uh, and uh, you visited now, the improvement on uh, transport infrastructure has been absolutely, especially roads, to be specific has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, now, the city of Dar es Salaam, and uh, I heard that there was an urbanization uh, discussion today, has its uh, serious transport challenges, uh, for sure. And uh, I have my own views about uh, the uh, uh, rapid bus transit uh, solution that uh, it's there. Uh, 
Uh, I don't think it's a 40-year, 30-year solution. I think uh, if you want to sort out uh, uh, big city transport situations, you have to think about 40 years. Dar es Salaam is going to be mega city in 2027, which is 12 years from now. It's going to be more than 10 million people. And uh, there are about uh, four cities, uh, four towns outside Dar es Salaam. Bagamoyo, Kiba, Kisarawe, Mkuranga. These are not in Dar es Salaam region. This is in the coastal region. In the next 12 years, uh, these will be Dar es Salaam. And uh, so to move people in these major arteries uh, towards the city, which is also another problem, because people shouldn't really be moving to the city center, all of them, to look for services. So, so there, is, uh, there is thought, uh, at least in some of us within the party, to think about uh, Dar es Salaam, to think about Tanzania in the next 40, 50 years. And that's when you can have uh, solutions that may work. And there's um, two questions just here. Perhaps we could take them together in the, in the middle. Good afternoon. My name is Sheila. I'm from Nigeria. And I'm um, going back to the topic of education. Yeah. So what is knowing that education is a huge thing and there's so many layers of complexities that affect education, what is the bigger priority? Getting more people into schools or improving the quality of the curriculum? and the teachers and the facilities of the school. And we'll take the next question at the same time. Sure. I think this has to be the last. OK. Um, my name is Precious Adeho. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, my question is, the first one is, uh, as a government official, you've been in the parliament. What, has, what, has, what are the policy governments has put in place to drive backward integration from various economic sectors? The second one is, you talk about uh, school. Um, student being uh, obedient. Have uh, business stopped looking for obedient workers? If no, they will change the economy, the school system. Thank you. All right, I'm not sure if I got the last bit. Uh, but uh, uh, from Sheila, uh, this has been a debate uh, quality versus access. Uh, whether we should wait. Uh, for us to sort out uh, quality, uh, then you know uh, we can increase uh, access. Uh, given the demographic structure of our countries, you know, if you take Nigeria for instance, uh, a lot of young people, a lot not young people, kids. Uh, uh, when you have a country where above 15, uh, 40. 43 percent are under 14, uh, and in Tanzania, likewise, uh, that means that uh, you know you somehow. And in fact, having a problem of uh, uh, you have to put them in school and sort out the problem of uh, quality, uh, because access that's what start. And uh, you can't know the magnitude of uh, quality challenge if you haven't uh, provided access for all. Uh, so that's where you begin. You begin with uh, providing access. And it's unfortunate that uh, you may lose a generation of uh, kids who have just gone to school to, as a playground, uh, as sad as that is. Uh, but then you will start to build another generation of uh, those who have uh, benefited uh, from your lessons about how to improve, uh, how to improve quality. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge that uh, all African countries grapple with. We here in 2006, 2007, uh, in terms of secondary education, it's something that we grappled. We built uh, since independence to, 19, to, to 2005, we have had 1,200 secondary schools, 1,200 secondary schools for the past 46 years. But for the past 10 years, we have built more than 3,000 schools. So in 10 years, we've built more schools than we have built since independence. And when you provide that massive 
access, of course, quality drops. But at least we know uh, the challenge that we face uh, in terms of improving, 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 uh, improving uh, uh, quality. So, uh, admittedly, we for the past ten years, kids who have gone through these these schools, we may tragically call them a lost generation, but kids who are going now onwards will have education uh, that they so deserve. Uh, the last question about, uh, can, you, can you state again, because I'm not sure if I got, I got the question correct. He said, um, what are policies that government has put in place to drive backward integration through other sectors of economy? Uh, I think, in fact, uh, if you're talking about forward and backward linkages in different sectors, right? Uh, only the other day in Dodoma, in the cabinet, we were talking about, uh, we approved actually, by the way, the new uh, local content uh, uh, gas policy, which does precisely what you are, you are saying. It links, uh, it links this huge gas economy and of course also the whole natural resource uh, extraction uh, economy uh, to other economic activities uh, in the country. Uh, and making sure that uh, local businesses uh, benefit, uh, making sure that uh, uh, the industries that can support these huge economies can, insurance, transport, logistics, uh, financial services, uh, hospitality, uh, and all these range of, uh, of uh, uh, activities in the country are linked to these huge, um, uh, huge, huge uh, economies. So uh, efforts are being made, uh, frankly. So far, to be honest with you, uh, the state of affairs could improve, um, uh, but uh, efforts are being made for precisely that to, to happen. And I'm sure it's not a challenge for Tanzania. It's a challenge you know, across, uh, across uh, the continent where uh, the linkages has not, have not been established to an extent where the benefits of economic growth uh, are not uh, seen by uh, many people. Uh, and I think uh, you know, that's a challenge for us in leadership to make sure that that happens. So we're going to have to draw to a close. We've covered so many subjects, but I'm going to take away three words. Curiosity, innovation, and ethics. And I wondered if you could all join me in thanking the minister, January Makamba. Thank you so much for joining us.